I was down with the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
32 years ago today, February the 11th, it was in uh, 1990, Mike, Iron Mike Tyson got defeated by James Buster Douglas in a 10 by 10 round TKO in the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. Mike Tyson got defeated by James Buster Douglas. I want to tell you this because it plays into why that happened. And I need you to know that it goes down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, upset in sports history. Tyson went into this fight as a 42 to 1 favorite. He had a record he carried into that fight of 37 wins and no losses. And yet, he was defeated by James Buster Douglas. Tyson had become and still is now at the age of 20, the youngest man to actually get the WBC, the WBA, and the IBF belts, title belts, all at one time. Matter of fact, his history or his career was at its apex during 1988 when he went down to Atlantic City and brutally dismantled Michael Spinks, who was previously undefeated. He beat him in a record 91 seconds. But he lost to James Buster Douglas. What happened at this time when his career had just reached an apex, we found out that he was going through a situation where uh, the, the decisive victory he had over Sphinx sent him to a place where the demons start coming out of his soul, where he had a chaotic lifestyle had just begun. He had found himself with uncontrolled anger. He found himself trying to control his situation around him. It was at this time that he married Robin Gibbons. And you all know that was a tumultuous relationship that ended in a divorce and her filing for uh, domestic abuse or spousal abuse. Shortly after that happened, he actually went to prison for two years for rape. Mike Tyson now, at the tender age of only 23, had battles in his marriage, battles with the press, battles with his management, battles in the court, battles with his fan base, and everything in his life seems to be falling apart. The night before he fought James Buster Douglas, he had stopped training, he had walked around with this arrogance that he didn't need to, he was overweight, and when he stepped into that ring, everything fell apart on him. You know why? Mike Tyson never recovered from the battles he was going through before he stepped in that ring. He was traumatized before he stepped in that ring with Jane Buster Douglas. Can I put the icing on the cake to let you know why we can tell that he had not recovered? To tell that he was traumatized is because after he came out of prison, he actually had the fight that we also know is infamous with Evander Holyfield. And during that fight was when he did something so bizarre that no one can even believe it. But it happens to you when you're traumatized. He bit his ear off. Mike did not want to lose again. He never recovered from losing from James Buster Douglas. And he bit his ear off because he was traumatized. Here it is. Mike Tyson had 58 fights. He had 50 wins. He had most of them by knockout. But here's the thing. His losses and his ties came after he lost to James Buster Douglas. Mike Tyson never recovered from a battle. But Mike Tyson isn't the only one. There's a whole lot of believers and some people I'm talking to. The reason your life keeps escalating over and over again. The reason you can't find a place of peace. The reason that it seems like something that didn't affect you as hard as it did the first time it happened can wipe you out. Now listen to me. It's because you never recovered from the battles you were going through.
You never got through the situation and handled it. You had some traumas and some hurts and some disappointments and some failures and a lot of things happened in your life and you kept going along as we do. Most of the time we try to fake it, we try to push it out of our mind, or we get to the place that we act like we overcome or we just get stuck. At best, many of you talking to me, even if you don't want to identify what I'm saying, many of you understand your life is not and one of the main reasons for your not happiness is because constant battle after battle after battle with no rest in between, with no time to get your thoughts back together, with no time for you to recover means that you are walking through this life, living through with a mind that does not work. Constant battle leads to post-traumatic stress disorders and a whole host of other types of mental problems. We're talking about you need to learn how to recover because you make decisions now or have made decisions that has messed your life up just like Mike and now you found out that you actually sabotaged your own life and you're not living the life God designed for you. You're not living the life God planned for you. You're not living the life you like. You're serving God and don't even like your life because there is constant struggles going on in our life. Recovery, recovery, recovery is defined as returning to a normal state of mental, a normal state of health that includes mental, emotional, psychological, and physical health. Now, when I say normal, normal is relative. Normal is what another is different between different people. But what the statement is saying, if you know your recovery, it means that after you went through that battle, you had a period that you returned to some stability in your life before you took on another battle. And if you did not, you found yourself going down, going under, and you found yourself in a situation that you needed to recover. You need a break. You need to stop. Medicine will help. Therapy will help. But Jesus is the ultimate source of recovery. Did you hear what I said? Medicine may help you. Therapy may help you. But you better listen to what I want to teach and preach today. It's a phenomenon that can happen to anybody. That has happened to a lot of people. And all of us have to deal with. And that is we have to learn how not to sabotage our life. How to make sure we get some sort of recovery. We recognize some sort of need that we need to recover before we move on and pile stuff on top of stuff. Mark chapter 6. Listen to Jesus talking to his disciples. They had just, if you can understand the context, these disciples, they were living in the time when the law and the Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees were in charge, but they decided because they got delivered, they got an understanding of who Jesus Christ was, they left their families. They left their businesses. They left the trade that they were doing. They left following the law. And they started following this itinerant, this carpenter who had become an itinerant preacher, prophet. And everything he was saying was against what other folks were saying. As a matter of fact, he was rejected in his own hometown. And the disciples were right there when they rejected him. And as they were walking around, following this Jesus, giving up everything, you got to know that they were going through trauma, they were going through trials, they were going through struggles, just like you and I. And they found themselves in a situation right after John the Baptist died. Jesus sent them out two by two. He said, go into the houses and evangelize. Can you imagine? They went out pushing this strange gospel. And everywhere they went, they had to go through a trial. And when they came back after hearing that John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, had died, look at what Jesus said to them in Matthew 6, verse 31 and 32. He said, come aside by yourselves, listen tightly, and go to a deserted place and rest a while. 
He was not talking about, as you'll see as I go through this text, he wasn't talking about just physical rest. He said, go apart and rest a while. For there were many people coming, still in the text, still in the text. There were many people coming, and they did not even have a chance to eat. And the 32nd verse says, so they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Jesus said, stop. You need recovery. You just came back from a stressful ministry. You need some time. So you need to spend some time with me resting. You need to spend some time with me so that I can handle those trials you're going through. You were never designed to try to handle those trials by yourself. And if you don't believe that, look at Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. We all know the scripture. Jesus made sure when he went out and talked to the folk who were downtrodden, to the folk who were overrun, he's talking to somebody you and me. Somebody, somebody's put in the chat right now. I need a break. Because here's what God is saying. He spoke to them. He said, come on. All that labor are tired and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, listen. That's why I said, he didn't say go somewhere and just meditate. He didn't say go somewhere and just, you know, meditate. He said go somewhere when you come to me where you take on my burden, you take on my yoke, you understand that I love you, that I have you. I will be with you. I will give you rest in what you have to do so that you can recover. He said, I'll make sure you get back everything you lost. Oh, somebody hear that? God said, I'll get you back everything you lost if you come to me. Come on, we need this teaching. Everybody listen to me. Either you've been through a battle, you're in a battle right now, or there's a battle waiting on you, so you better listen because God is the only one that has a safe place for us. And the battles we have to go through are frequent, they are, 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 are heightening, that they're, they're destroying us, and every time you turn around, we get less and less able, watch me, to walk in a life of peace. But how many know God promised you peace? If you can hear me today, there is peace. Because they never learned how to recover. You remember King Saul? 
who got to the place where he couldn't handle his jealousy, never recovered from the battle of his jealousy. He heard the maiden singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David's his ten thousands, and that jealousy ate him up. I know people who have been jealous over other folk for years, and sometimes the folk don't even know you jealous over them, and you're letting that stuff eat you up, and it ended up with him never able to recover or get a break, and you know what happened? He ended up dying by his own hand after channeling a witch. That's right. The first king of God ended up calling witches. I don't have time. And then dying by his own hand. When you don't get some rest, this is a serious thing. You not only do dumb decisions when you're under stress, but you do decisions that are detrimental to you and your family because his sons died on the battlefield with him. And we know Judas never recovered after betraying Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of of silver, but the good news is God is a recovering God. All these people could have made it if they just came to God. Can I give you these couple scriptures, then move right into this text and kind of get through it so you can understand that God wants to give you a prescription to get the rest. I'm talking to somebody. Lift your hand if I'm talking to you. Tell yourself, I'm getting ready to get out of this rut. I'm not going to allow myself to stay down psychologically, mentally, emotionally, laying in my bed, fighting demons, fighting darkness, and supposed to be a child of God living in the light. Somebody holler, I'm through with all that. And watch what God says. God is a God who can bring us back. Write this down. Psalms 30 and 11. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You took the sackcloth off my back. And when you took the sackcloth off my back, you dressed me in gladness. This is what God said. And I know I got a witness. God said, even when you're in mourning, the situation doesn't have to change. But oh, when I show up, somebody ought to say, God show up right now. God said, when I show up, I can take a person who's going through struggles and make them dance. I'll turn their crying into dancing, and I will take that burden of that sackcloth, whatever it is, the battle that got them down, and I will give them the garments of gladness. Also, Psalms 34 and 18 Psalms 34, 19, we all like to say many are the afflictions of the righteous, but go to 18. I love 18. It says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as are of a crushed spirit. Something can crush our spirit. When we have a broken heart, we mourn. He comforts us so that we can learn how to recover, even in affliction. One more, Psalms 119 and 50. This is my comfort, Psalms 119 and 50, and consolation in my affliction. See, the reason I don't worry about affliction is because I have a consolation in my affliction. How many know we're holding on to the everlasting hands of God? I got a comfort in my, that it won't overcome me. It, it can't take me out. Where the folks that have shouted, they tried to take me out, but it couldn't take me out because God was on my side. Here's my comfort in my affliction, that your word has revived me and given me life. This psalm, Psalms 138, is tailored to teach us how to get to the place that we receive recovery in our spirits and holistic recovery in our minds and our bodies. What am I talking about? We did Psalms 137, and you know, these Psalms happen at different times, on different timelines, but whoever put the Bible together, God, made sure that 137 came after 138, and that's significant even though there's other time in between, because 137 is when they were in exile, and it was teaching how to sing in exile. How are we going to sing in exile? But Psalms 138 is saying, not only will I learn to sing in exile, but kings are going to sing. Psalms 138 was saying, I got to learn how to function in exile. No, but Psalm 137 is saying, which God placed it in there, that you now need to learn how to recover after you come out of exile. Did you catch that? When you come out of a burden, don't act like it didn't affect you. That's why people die. You need to make sure you learn this prescription that I'm giving you for recovery. Because recovery happens when, you, uh, when you're in exile. When you come out of exile, you need recovery. Why do you think they send drug addicts off to 
recovery. It's called why? Because they've been walking around the life they've been living has been exiled. Why do you think when someone has a breakup or a bad divorce, they go around and they need recovery? They need therapy to recover. And if they don't recover, we have all seen it. We have all got a coin, a phrase for it. We say when they get back into a relationship before they have recovered from what was hurting them, we say they got caught up in the rebound. They, they were still rebounding, but they never rebound to recovery. And they got somebody else now, which brought them another battle, and they just got caught up in the rebound. Recovery is like sur it's like uh, the pain after surgery. It's going to hurt for a while, but if you trust God, you will recover. I want you to write this down. Three things. Here's our prescription. i got to get them out so I can go ahead and teach them. I want you to write them down because I want you to stand with me. Live your chains. The first thing. The psalmist is going to tell us is live your change. Um, the, the, live your change. Um, lead, second point, lead others to your source. Hmm. As you lead others to your source, you are reminded of the source you have. And then learn or lean on God's love. Let's say it again. Live your change. Lead others to your source. And then lean on God's word. Let's look at this first verse of 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the God, I will sing your praise. The overall occasion of this psalm is not some special moment. It is a culmination when the psalmist has been going through a dark time in their life, figuratively, it could have been weeks, it could have been months, it could have been years, and then finally something shined on the inside of them that said, I don't want to stay here any longer. I am tired of this. They thought about the fact that I've been going through constant battle after battle, stay with me, after battle, but here is the shout. Even though I've been going through battle after battle, can I tell you something you ought to shout about? Because you have a God who knows how to restore, how to renew, how to give fresh beginnings, here's what you ought to shout about. Forget the battle. Here's your first step to recovery. You got to tell yourself, I'm still here. Man. Your mind has been thinking about the trouble, but you haven't thought about the fact that even though you've been through the trouble, I'm still here. Somebody ought to celebrate that right now. I don't know the hell you went through. I don't know the stuff you suffered in your life. I don't know what happened to your children, your mind, your body. But can I tell you something? If you're listening to me right now, you ought to be able to lift your hand and say, he's right. All of that stuff, I'm still here. What the devil thought would take me out didn't work. What I thought in my mind, I wasn't able to overcome. I overcame it. Is there I'm not just going to change. I'm not going to say, I want to change. No, I'm going to start living my change. That's what the psalmist said right here. He said, I will praise you with my whole heart. He was saying, I'm a survivor, and I want to celebrate my survival so a change will come in my life. you got to tell yourself, it may have been bad. But I survive. It's time for me to realize God must have more for me. All I'm preaching right now, God has more for you. He did not want you staying in that. But you got to get to the point where you say, I've been trying to change from before. But now I'm going to live my change. Glory to Gainer. Uh, when I start talking about I'll survive. I, know, I need you to know, just walk me right into that. But I heard an interview with her on TVN. She was being interviewed by Clifton Davis. And on that interview, I found so many other things about her. But that song, I Will Survive, we all know it. But that song, I did not know that that song, when it won a Grammy in 1979, was up against some of the greatest artists of the time. And she was a little-known artist and blew them all away. She was up against Michael Jackson, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. She was up against Donna Summers, the queen of disco herself. Bad girls. Doo -doo, you know what I'm talking about. She was up against Rod Stewart, if you think I'm sexy. But when they interviewed her, she said it was the spirit of this song. This song has become an anthem for anybody who survived anything. You know the first part it says, at first I was afraid. I was petrified, you know, uh, thought I'd never make it without you by my side, right? He said, I spent so many nights thinking, but watch this, how you did me wrong, and I grew strong. But the course 
is what blows you away. Listen to the chorus. Oh, no, not I. I will survive. I want you to apply this. As long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive. I got all my life to live. Yes, you do. In God. I got all my love to give. I will survive. I will survive. Hey, hey. But it's the second verse that blows me away. It took all the strength I had not to fall apart. Stop. Quit acting like something's supposed to happen magically. Oh, I got you right now. Here's what you need to know. If you want to talk to us or you want to talk to survivors, we'll tell you survival is not this sweet thing that happens instantly. It's not something that happens sometimes suddenly. This thing is a day by day. Get up in the morning. Trust God for this day. Make a declaration I'm going to make it through this day. And then look that demon in the face that had you. Look that trouble in the face. Look that failure in the face and say, doesn't make a difference. I'm changing now. I will survive. And then it said, I spent so, oh, it said, kept trying to hard to mend the pieces of my broken heart. I spent oh so many nights just feeling sorry for myself. I used to cry, but now, because you made a change, I hold my head up high. Now, I'm not just singing this song because you say, Pastor, you know you're always doing songs. I do love music, but there's a story behind this. The writer of this song wrote this song out of a situation in his own life. He had just gotten fired from Motown, having been there seven years, and they told him he had no more talent. He was washed up. He was done. He wrote the song. Donna, excuse me, Gloria Gaynor got a hold of it. When Gloria Gaynor did the song, they wanted her to do the other side, but she did this side because, watch this, she had just come through six months in the hospital after a painful back surgery, not knowing where her life was going. When she recorded this song, they had to prop her up in the studio to record it. And she said something about that song got down on the inside of her. And she said, I, I figured out this song is blessing everyone. I know I will survive. The songwriter said it helped him know I'm a great songwriter. I will survive. Somebody out there listening to me need to write in the chat. I'm going to survive. I don't care how bad it gets. I'm going to keep fighting through it. I don't care what anybody else whispers in my ear. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care who I got to leave behind, what I got to leave behind. God got survival for me. And I'm going to make sure that I survive. You know what happened? Here's why it's interesting. Since that song was released, Gloria Gaynor became a devout Christian. Yep. She was at a point where she needed some help in her life. She got into a room by herself after leaving church. And ask God, Lord, I need you. If you're going to show up. She said, in that room with just me and the Holy Spirit. Oh, I found out that I needed God. And she said, now in my live performances, I actually have changed some verses to represent my Christian faith. She said, one of them is, I will survive. He gave me life. I stand behind it, beside the crucified one. I can't go on. I'll be strong. For my strength to live is not my own. I will survive. He gave me life. I stand behind, beside the crucified one. I can't go on. I will be strong. For my strength to live is not my own. I will survive. There is what you shout about. You got to make sure you understand the reason I can shout out survive because the strength to survive is not mine. It is God's. That's what Gloria Gaynor did. She reconnected with God. How do, you, how do you make a change? You reconnect with God. What happened? When you look at what the psalmist said, I will praise you with my whole heart. He said, I'm not just going to praise you with my mind. I'm going to praise you with my physical heart. I'm going to fall in love with you, but I'm also going to praise you with the seat of my emotions heart. Everything about me will love you. I always tell couples when I'm counseling them that you got to make sure you understand what real love is. And the only way to stay together is to realize we can't stay together and one of us don't understand that we got to push each other through in the bad times of our life. Nobody's perfect, but we got to learn how to push each other through. And then he said, then I always tell them, I know uh, you're, you're talking about how bad it is, but God did not uh, love you through all of the bad things he knows about you. I thought about this one time. God knows everything I thought. Oh, scary. God knows everything I did. Some of y'all, you say scary. God knows everything I thought about. God knows the stuff I got way with. But you know what? He keeps keeping me and loving me through it. You got to learn that as long as you will praise God with your whole heart, 
praise will bring freedom because it breaks the bondages of the things that are holding you. Verse 2, he said, I will worship toward your holy temple. Look what he said. I will recommit. I'm going to reconnect by worshiping God. That will get me back. Then I'm going to reconnect to you by telling you that I will worship toward your holy temple. Your loving kindness is true. And look what he said in verse 10. Your word, your word has been magnified above your name. I read that. And I said, what is the psalmist saying? What is God saying? How do I recommit to God? you got to understand something. God's name and the name of Jesus is the most powerful name out there. But what does he mean his word is above it? The word means magnify is the word gadal in the Hebrew. And the word gadal means it is lifted up, it is shining through, it shines on something, it, it glorifies something. Here's what, here's what God is saying, uh, uh, that his word, uh, his name is good, but when I praise him, I actually can now use his word through the words of my praise, it gets stronger. Uh, okay, let me, let me explain. You can have... A luxury car, a Mercedes, a Volvo, an Audi, whatever, whatever, whatever you think a luxury car is. And, and, I, and I better mention some of these big old trucks when you see some of the price tags on them. You can have a Chevy Silverado or you can have a Ford uh, F-150. These are luxury trucks. These things cost a lot of money. Or you can have you a Toyota Tacoma. Whatever it is, it is pretty. And when you say you own it, people will be, wow. Just like saying the name of God, wow, Jehovah Jireh. Well, but here is what happens. That car can be as pretty as it wants, but until you put gas in it, that pretty car is going to sit right there. All God is saying is that my word is just like that gas that kind of cranks that car up. Now you drive that car to my house, and you go to horn, and you ride down the road, and you lean in. All of a sudden, now you see how beautiful it is when you connect it. That's what the word of God does. There's a name of Jesus. But before you do the name of Jesus, find you a word you can claim to put on the name of Jesus. Come on, I'm preaching now. Listen, you got to find a word. If you say, by his stripes I'm healed, in the name of Jesus, what you did first was throw that word out there. Somebody say, by his stripes I'm healed. And now put that power on it. Because now you just magnified his name. The word just magnified and rose up God's name. So now you say, in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. In the name of Jesus, I'm, he will provide for me. God will supply my needs. In the name of Jesus, my children are blessed. In the name of Jesus, my house is blessed. Somebody give the chills right now. In the name of Jesus, things are going to change in my life. Because you got to recognize that God says you have to reconnect. You have to recommit. And finally, the psalmist says, verse 3, In the day that I cried, you answered me. you got to receive more strength. How you live your change is reconnect the worship. Recommit. To making sure you know that word and you'll lift up and pray toward his temple. And then thirdly, remember that whatever God has already done, he can do again. Can I give you one more glory or gain a story from that interview that I watched? It, it'll bless you. After giving her life to God, watch this, the bottom dropped out. Things got bad. She got into a divorce with her husband, who was her manager. Things got tough. She found herself broke. She had to move in with her niece. And then she ran into a friend. She had just enough money for bus fare to go across town to meet him and come back. When she got there, she said, I hate to ask, but I said, you know, can you give me a couple of dollars until... So it was a good friend. A friend pulled off $300 and gave it to her. And she was just overjoyed. She went back to the house, cooked dinner for her niece. But she saw her niece come in the house crying because her niece had gone down to pay the rent, which was $300. And when she went down to pay the rent, the man said, no, you got another debt here. You have to pay me, the landlord. And then she said, and I couldn't pay the rent. And all of a sudden, Gloria Gaynor said, don't worry. Here, take this $300. Her niece looked at her and said, what are you going to do, auntie? You, you got no money. What are you going to do? And she said a word that you want to say every time the enemy tells you God don't work. She said a word. She said, God who provided last time will provide again. I need somebody to take a break right now. And just shout that in your house. God, who provided last time, will provide again. That's the kind of God we serve. What am I talking about? Her niece then came up to her an hour later. So I forgot to give you your mail. When she opened the mail, go check out the interview on TBN. When she opened the mail, she said there was a check for $300. She said she looked 
And to this day, she does not know where that check came from. You got to live your change. Then you got to lead others to your source. Look at verse 4, 5, and 6. It says, All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Sinners can't hear the word of God's mouth unless I speak it. And if I speak it, I get stronger. I'm going to teach you a phrase. You got to learn how to declare and decree. You declare the God who brought you over, the God who you possess, the God who's blessed you, and then you decree, or you let the decree of God's word. When God speaks something, it's a decree. When God speaks something, it's going to come to pass. The word declare actually means it's something that I speak with, and, and with solemnness and with an emphatic belief. An emphatic belief. The word decree is something that is ordered by someone in power to come to pass. You got to learn how to declare and decree. So whenever something's going on in your life, just declare what God says. When you see other people, you start declaring what God says. You start living in front of them. And they will then, that's what the text says, they'll start speaking about your God. They will start speaking about your God. Declare and decree. This is important. We have to learn to declare and decree the truth that is in front of us. This will bless us. In chapter 4 of the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar did this. If you go to the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel, you'll find out the whole chapter is his testimony about how he discovered God. And in verse 37 of the fourth chapter, he said, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth. This, this, this is a foreign guy talking. Whose works are truth and his ways and judgment and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Follow that. Daniel, Tarek, Meshach, and Abednego live so, Abednego lived so in front of King Nebuchadnezzar. What this chapter is about is the king had a dream. He called all of his soothsayers, all of his astrologers, all of his magicians. They could not answer. He wouldn't tell them what it was. But Daniel came, Daniel who served the true and living God, he was able to tell him. And in it, he told him, the kingdom is going to be taken from you because you got too much pride. And the Bible said, as soon as that happened, one day Nebuchadnezzar stepped out onto his palace deck and said, look at great Babylon, which I alone have created. And the Bible said the Lord spoke to him and said the kingdom is going to be taken out of your hand. Seven years. Please follow me. Seven years. You're going to walk around as the beast of the field. You're not even going to be able to walk in your kingdom. Do you realize that when you get to the point that you don't recover, you can lose seven years of your life or more? Mike Tyson was 23, the tender age of 23. And he, all of his losses came after his win or after his loss to Buster Douglas. He never got it back again. He toiled 20-some more years and never, ever came back to fighting for him. He never recovered. He lost all of those years because he didn't stop and allow God to recover. So you got to live your shame. Then you got to make sure you lead people to your source. A farmer tells the story of a pond and a stream that was on his property. Problem. And it said the stream, you know, streams flow from other streams or underwater sources. Ponds are made by an overflow during rainy season. Something is hollowed out and it'll fill up. It'll be a pond. And both of them are filled with refreshing water during rainy season, during good times. But when the dry times come, that's when their true nature comes out. That's when you find who they are. And that's what happened here. Watch what happened. A dry season came, and the stream, which was flowing from a larger bottom of body of water, which naturally had an underground source, kept its banks full and was able to continue flowing because it was moving by the power of the bigger body. Oh, I'm preaching. It was moving by the body. But the pond, when the dry season came, because it just happened to overflow, you, it looked like good water until you got in trouble. And then all of a sudden, it dried up. And when it dried, when the pond dried up, we found out that it was sitting there 
stagnant, foul. Do you know any source you use other than God, that's what happens to our life. You want to find out. It looks like fresh water. Ooh, it looked good. But it will turn stagnant. Let me close this. You will sing the ways of the Lord. Verse 5. God's ways are the best way. Quit. You know God is the way. Somebody right now, on the right chat, I know God is the way. I need to change. I need to let somebody know my source because I need to trust my source. You know, one of the craziest things I heard about gambling is that how a person gets addicted to gambling playing around with something as precious as their money, their rent money, their car payment money, their child's money, is because gamblers work under this fallacy that if I keep doing it, sooner or later, something good will happen. Think about it. You can flip a coin in the air five times and it lands on tails five times. But the gambler will say, well, it lands on tails five times. Sooner or later, something got to get it. But no. Every time you flip that coin, there's still a 50-50 chance it will land on heads or tails. You're fooling yourself by continually gambling with the only source you know work. Come back to God right now. I'm prophesying. I'm speaking in somebody's life. Get serious about your God. Leave somebody to your source. If you want recovery in your life, I don't know what you've been through. A death, maybe you're grieving, a divorce, I don't know. But to recover means you've got to go back to the source and lead somebody else to that source. The final one. Lean on God. Wow. Verse 7 and 8 is the core of this text. Are you with me? Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. Here is the ingredient to the prescription that works the best. It's saying, though I walk around in trouble. It's, here, here's what we're saying. The reason it's a prescription for recovery, because he said, when you're in trouble, I'll revive you. God knows how to lift us at the time that we are in trouble, because God's revival is supernatural. Right now, I'm speaking to somebody who is in an untenable situation. You're going through something you've been in for years. Matter of fact, you don't even like your salvation. Say it with me. But God said, if you understand, I will revive you. The word revive means I will help you recover even while you're in trouble. Somebody ought to lift their hands and say, I'm going to recover today. I'm going to lean on God until I recover because God has promised to revive me. What's so powerful about that? He said, this is a promise. I'll revive you in trouble. Nobody else can do that. Everything else has to wait till the trouble leaves. I'll revive you in trouble. He said, now do it with my right hand. In scripture, God's strongest hand is his right hand. He said, I will lift you with my right hand. It is the hand of God that will bring you out. And then as we close, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Did you hear it? He will make sure that the trials, the failures, the stuff I've been through, he'll perfect it so my life comes back to a place of recovery. It'll be just as if, I got some people out there, can you put in the chat witness, God knows how to turn your life around. God knows how to make sure that you don't even remember the crazy stuff that happened. And God said, I will never forsake you. I will never forsake the, the, the works of my the hand. The works of my hands, the works that I've done. I want to close this, and you guys are going to get a little upset with me. Probably not, but maybe you go, I know I'm Gloria Gaynor, crazy here today. But she said one more thing in the interview that when she got sold out to God, she wanted to do something for God. So she said, God, you know what I'm going to do? Every song I make, I'm going to put one gospel record on my record. God said, no, don't do that. She said, no. She said, well, Lord, I'll put two. She said, no, don't do that. And Gloria said, she looked at God and said, well, you don't want me to put any, sing about you at all? God came back and said, no. If I'm your source, if I'm the one who perfects your life, I want you to put all of, all of the songs about me. I want you to sing about that which is getting you over. Can I tell you, Gloria Gaynor now is a gospel singer. She has taken that song, I Will Survive, when she gets in the door, she's putting some gospel verses to it, but she's got whole albums out where she's singing to God because God is her source. 
your prescription for recovery. Live your change. Don't talk about it. Recommit. Reconnect. Recommit. Remember. Same God. Lead other folk to your source. You start talking about your source. The source will come back to you. And then lean on God. And you will find yourself in a position where every time you're in trouble, He will revive you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, God bless you. Please make sure you go to our site, go to our channel, and uh, leave some more, leave some information there. Let us know you're enjoying the word. But also, if you will, if you'd be so kind, we appreciate it. Um, if you go on our website, you'll know the work that we do. The website is on is, is written down there so you can see it. And you'll know the work that we do. Go to give and make sure you give something to this ministry. God bless you again. Thank you. And remember, this is your prescription, wherever you are right now, to recover from everything you've been through. God bless you. Leave it there. I was down but with no way up and I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living just existing Well and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free What he did for me